I've got my Tito t-shirt on, which can only mean one thing. Today we're looking at an anamorphic lens, the one that generally excites me a lot. What I have here is the Great Joy 50mm T2.9 1.8x stretch anamorphic cine lens. Some of you might know me as a vintage lens fanatic and this lens shares a lot of things I enjoy about vintage lenses, including interesting image characteristics, affordable price point and some usability features that we will get into shortly. But first a quick disclaimer, Great Joy did send me this pre-production lens for review but had zero say in what this video will be, so it's 100% my own views and opinions. With this out of the way, let's figure out what actually excites me about this lens. Because I don't get excited by modern lenses that often, especially the ones that I can afford. There are quite a few anamorphic modern lenses that I would love to own, but they generally start around $8,000 and that just isn't affordable to me at all. Not this lens though, at launch it will be just over $1,100 for one of the mirrorless options which is incredible for a lens of this spec. But even the lens of my choice, the PL mount option, will be just $13.59 at launch and then 20% higher uh, on general sale. But uh, even at its higher price, there is nothing that comes close. The cheapest PL mount equivalent that I'm aware of is the Vazen 50mm T2.1, but that lens is $8,000, which is five to six times more expensive than this lens. On the high end, we have something like Cook 1.8 times anamorphics, and those are 20 to 25 times more expensive than this lens. So solely from the price perspective, this lens offers an incredible value, but the price itself means nothing if this lens doesn't deliver images that are at least five times worse than Vazen or 20 times worse than Cook. I haven't used either Cook or Vazen anamorphics, but looking at online references, I can say that this lens is neither 20 times nor 5 times worse than the competition. In fact, one could argue that it's uh, better than Vazen in some ways. Of course, Vazen has its strong points, but when you think about the fact that you can get a set of three Great Joy anamorphics for half the price of one Vazen, it's difficult to justify those advantages. I think it's safe to say this lens isn't many times worse than the competition, but outside of that, is it actually any good? Well, I never like to tell you what's good or not, I would much rather have you make up your own mind. But if you were to ask me, I think this lens is damn impressive. First of all, it's very sharp. I took it to number 9 Optics in London and tested this lens on their brilliant projector where it was resolving 200 line pairs in the middle wide open with just a gentle fall off on the sides. Obviously, as you stop it down, it improves even further, but we knew that already. Coverage is very impressive also. When I was first introduced to this lens, I was told that it's a Super 45 lens and I was planning to use it on my Red Komodo, only to be pleasantly surprised when I've tested it on my Sony A7S Mark III and I found out that it actually covers the whole 16x9 sensor with just a little bit of vignetting on the edges. 16x9 is not the best recording mode for a 1.8x stretch anamorphic lens anyway. You end up with a very wide aspect ratio that you will probably have to crop in to have something a bit more usable and by then all the vignetting is gone. Where this lens really shines though is a dedicated 4x3 anamorphic mode. Red Komodo has that and it works brilliantly but that's a Super 45 sensor where it really really shines is a full frame 4x3 shooting mode. That's where you maximize everything that this lens is capable of. Either way, whichever sensor you have, whichever shooting mode you're gonna be using, I think coverage will not really be a big issue. One of the characteristics that a lot of vintage lenses share is breathing. Yes, this lens has breathing as well, but it's very minimal and uh, only really visible in static shots when you are rocking all the way from close focus to infinity. A more annoying feature of the synchro focus method that this lens uses is a change of the stretch factor. As you focus back from infinity to close focus, 
the stretch changes from 1.8 times to under 1.7. I'm sure Tito will have the exact figures. While annoying, it's quite easy to fix in post and I would much rather lose some of that stretch at the close focusing distance than lose the impressive and very useful close focusing distance of 0.7 meters. I was able to get some very nice close-ups without using a diopter once. Obviously, you can battle this change in stretch factor by using diopters and not focusing all the way to the close focusing distance. So you have those both options if you need them, but sometimes there's no time to put a diopter on, so it's very useful to have that close focusing ability. I don't actually think that for an anamorphic lens, this focal length is the best for extreme close-ups anyway. I hear there's an 85 coming and I would much rather use that for extreme close-ups. Let's not forget that this lens captures 1.8 times more information horizontally than the spherical equivalent. So in fact, what we have here is a widish field of view combined with a depth of field of a 50 millimeter T2.9 spherical lens. Talking about T-stops, while it might not sound impressive on a spherical lens, actually, as you can see yourself, this lens offers plenty of separation and bokeh action even on the wider shots bokeh is one of the top three most desired anamorphic features. One could even argue that people choose to use anamorphic lenses on their projects because of that oval anamorphic bokeh. So does this 1.8 times stretch lens produces oval enough bokeh? Absolutely! It's even a little swirly around the edges, which is for a Helios 44-2 fanboy like me is a big deal. I truly love it. Another very popular anamorphic feature is the distortion especially the barrel distortion, which creates somewhat of a 3D effect and draws viewer's eye to the middle of the frame. You will find that this distortion is very, very effectively used in a lot of Wes Anderson's films. So does Great Joy have a barrel distortion? Well, I haven't really noticed much of a distortion in real life shooting conditions. So I've tested it on a distortion chart and I actually found that this lens has both barrel and pincushion distortion at the same time, which is actually not such a bad thing because at least the edges of the frame are quite usable. They're not too stretched, they're not too squeezed. So the whole frame is usable. You can have your subject on the edge of the frame if you wish. Some people will still argue that a pure barrel distortion is better and maybe for the anamorphic look it is, but this is definitely the next best thing. Finally, we get to the most recognized, desired, and sometimes controversial feature, the streak flares. Yes, this lens has them, but they are quite subtle, well controlled, and show up only when you really force them with a strong point light source. Unlike Sirui, which I never really grown to love, this lens will not have a massive blue blob of flare when you have a window in the shot. Personally, I think Greyjoy achieved a very nice balance with the flares. Most of the time, there are simply no flares in the shot and uh, when they show up, they are quite soft with a gentle teal color. They don't feel too overpowering, too oversaturated. And uh, even though I quite like them, I would still rather have the amber flares if I could. Well, guess what? Turns out they will be making the amber version. And when the production model comes, I'll probably go for the amber myself. So to conclude on the optical side, for me, this lens scores really high. Regardless of the price, I think it's simply impressive. But is this lens actually a great joy to use? Well, I don't want to sound too positive, but this is a full-on, all-in-one anamorphic cine lens. There are no adapters, no anamorphic alignments, no clamps, no DIY. You simply take it, put it on the camera, and it's ready to go with everything you might need, including integrated follow focus gears, dual windowed focus markings, T-stop markings, 82mm filter thread, dual threads for lens support, and it weights just over one kilogram, which is not a lot for an anamorphic lens of such pack. So yes, this lens is indeed a great joy to use. I know it sounds like I'm making fun of the name, but I honestly don't mind it at all. Some people complain about it, but it's not like Sirui or even Vazen are such strong brand names. All of these companies still have a lot to prove to be taken seriously in the anamorphic cine lens market. And at the end of the day, all that matters are the end results. 
I really like this lens, but I would love to hear what you guys think, so please leave a comment down below. I hope you enjoyed this video, found it useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up so hopefully more people can see it. And I will see you in one of my next videos.